So no one likes paying full price for anything, right? I know I definitely don't. I will always shop for sales, but especially when it comes to online shopping. So I have a site for you and a discount code that you need to go to. It's called www.altus.store for 40% off using the discount code ALTUS40. That's A-L-T-U-S 40. And shop all the products, including clothes, accessories, from activewear to summer dresses. I just bought some new sunnies, so I'll let you know how they go. And if you just love online shopping, check it out and use the 40% off. So how do you solve a problem like Mariah? As my brother said, spoiler alert, you can't. So there you go. I'm just an Australian girl with the world at her feet, working in public relations and communications, who is learning about life and myself every single day. Join me as I tell you stories, share my outlook on life, and just talk utter garbage. This podcast is where I talk about my world, your world, and the world around us to hopefully inspire or just entertain. It will be fun, I promise. On today's episode, I got some extremely exciting news during the week on two separate occasions. I had a pretty crazy Friday night, and I have a special guest on my show to talk about the time that he lied his way into backstage of the Red Hot Chili Peppers. So let's get started. Welcome, I'm back for another episode of How Do You Solve a Problem Like Mariah? And I have some awesome news. I finally booked Europe. So Shelby, Danielle and Haley, and I will be leaving on August 23 to take on Europe for six weeks. I am beyond excited. If anyone has any travel tips for Europe, please send them to me on Instagram or even email. But I am over the moon. I owe a lot of money to the travel agent, but that's fine. It's booked and I'm super, super excited. So I want to make your year better for 2019. And I thought it'd be nice to ask my friend Shelby while she was laying on my couch a little bit seedy, what will make her year this year better? So what was her response? Exercising has made her feel better. Making an extra meal at dinner so that you have something for lunch, which is a great one, Shelb. And Jabani cookies and cream yogurt. So thanks for those, Shelby. They're her three making your year better ideas. And also living like a backpacker in your own country to save for Europe. We will be appreciating sandwiches in the park as our day out, she th- she said. So we will be backpackers in our own country so that we can live it up in Europe. Okay, so, you know, we all have moments where we write a document or we're typing up something at work and we need to proofread it like a thousand times. We might even read it back and then notice there's something missing or spelt wrong like days later. So my life hack is a website and app called Grammarly. So no word spell check can help you after all of that drama of handing something in with some spelling or grammar mistakes. So Grammarly is a plug-in to your computer and it'll pick up on things you might have missed or not even noticed with spelling, word choices and grammar. I love it. It's so good. That's my little life hack for if you do a lot of writing at work or if for uni, it would be would have been amazing when I was at uni, by the way. But check it out, Grammarly. I'll put the link in my show notes for you. Now, I want to recommend something to you guys and it's to apply for whatever you're too scared to apply for or whatever you're scared to do in general. I got some ex- more exciting news. So recently I applied for this challenge at my work for the women in our business. The program is called Women With Drive and it aims to help get women into leadership within the business of automotive by empowering them. So my work put a call out to all women to apply for this New Zealand challenge. So the challenge is hiking and camping around the surrounds of Queenstown for a week in what will be like a really mental and physical challenge for all those who take part. Now, I'm not a massive camping person. For those who know me, no, I don't really like camping. But I applied for it because it's an amazing opportunity and I got the news that I was one of 10 chosen. So I am so excited, so grateful. My work, Cox Automotive, you can check them out on LinkedIn and follow the journey of us nine women in New Zealand. I highly recommend you do that. But it's an experience that I'll never, ever get again. I don't even know if any workplaces will do this. So I am so excited and I'll definitely have more updates on that New Zealand challenge. I leave on the 31st of March. So this push out of my comfort zone was massive. 
And to even applying for it, you had to do a video and write about yourself and what you can bring to the table. And this would definitely push me out of my boundaries for that, as well as pushing my own boundaries while I'm there. And that's something I really want to do this year. This also happened in 2014 when I applied for a study tour to Malaysia and Singapore for university. Now, that was a huge test for me at that point in my life. I had no confidence to do anything. I was uh, had a lot of self-esteem issues and I just applied for it anyway. When I applied for it, I was at a point where I didn't really have much else going for me in terms of apart from uni. So I just applied for it and I got that as well and it turned out to be the best thing I ever did. I learned so much from it personally. I grew so much. I met new people. I let met my now extremely amazing friend Alyssa who's been on the podcast before in a couple episodes so my advice is if there's something that you have doubts of in your ability just apply for it anyway and you know the question I put out about lying to get an experience it was more to see who's really tested their boundaries to see what they can get out of themselves so this is kind of my recommendation of just pushing out of your comfort zone and applying for something you've always wanted to do, even if you're not too sure about it, just go for it. You'll learn, you'll make mistakes, and I'm sure you'll grow a lot from it. Now, my weekend, my last two weekends actually have been quite insane. I was in the beautiful Shellcott wedding, maid of honour, um, another massive congratulations to the bride and groom, It was such a fun day. The wind did not stop us and did not stop the celebrations. There was Canadian Club on tap. I think I probably drank. I don't even know how many of those I would have drank. But it was such a fun night and everyone had such a good time. I did end up at the local nightclub back home, which I haven't done in a very, very long time. So that was a lot of fun. As for the weekend just gone, one of the boys, Dean, asked if this would be on my podcast. So... I'm going to put it on. Um, So Britt and her friends stayed over at my house, Corey and Dean, before they flew out to Queensland for the weekend to see Nicola, one of our favourite guests. So we played a game to begin with called... um, Oh, gosh, I can't remember it. Anyway, the point of the game is when you get to 11, you say a keyword and then you can change any number to doing a certain thing so it was pretty fun there's a bit of a drinking game for you to play if you stuff it up you drink or something like that anyway we ended up going to Fitzroy for just a couple quiet drinks which are never quite quiet drinks in Melbourne and it ended when we all did coffee patron thanks Jake because I think that set everyone off there ended up being Chewy stuck to the back of one of the boys' jeans, <laughs> very stuck, and about four people sleeping in my lounge room. Woke up the next day to go get my blood test, which I had to fast for. When I got there, I realised I didn't have my paperwork, so I couldn't actually get the blood test, so that was a bit of a waste of time. And I spent the rest of Saturday in my housemate Abby's bed, along with one of the boys as we ate chicken nuggets and frozen drinks, which usually is a life hack hangover tip for me, but the frozen Coke did not help. I was startled a few times by Jake drying me with a hairdryer. Thanks for that, mate. And once everyone else had recovered and left me, I spent the rest of the afternoon sleeping in Abby's bed, which is very, very comfortable. Then you know you're struggling when you have 7-Eleven for dinner. And if you don't know what that means is, yes, I bought food from 7-Eleven for dinner. So a falafel wrap and some natural popcorn was my dinner. That was a struggle. And I need to remember, I am not 22 anymore. So that was the weekend. It was actually pretty fun, but I'm still currently recovering from that one. And the rest of the crew went on to Queensland, so... I hope they're going okay because Brittany booked a flight from Avalon and for those who don't live in Melbourne, um, Avalon is the furthest airport from the city and she left at 8 o'clock 
for a 10 past 10 flight. Uh, she made it, but way too risky for my liking. Anyway, so my special guest for today, his name is Matt Sager. Now, as you know, I was proposed a question to a podcasting group about have you ever lied to get yourself an experience? Now, I think Matt nearly takes the cake. So a bit of background on Matt. He's a voice actor. He's done a little bit of on-screen and stage acting, and he hosts his own podcast, as well as doing a bit of writing and producing. So after he left his internship, which you'll hear about soon, He lived in New York City where he interned for the radio station K-Rock, for those who don't know, and he ended up getting a full-time position, which was very hard in those times. He's appeared in a few episodes of Celebrity Deathmatch on MTV, and all of his voiceover gigs, that's probably one that excites the most. He's done a lot of voiceover work in commercials, anime, training videos, training videos for Netflix hires and he was born and raised in New York. His biggest points of pride was as a disc jockey where he didn't have to move to find work and he just loved the work that he did there. So let's talk to Matt. Thanks so much Matt for joining my show. Um, so first of all, no, thank you for having me. Thank you. Just uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself. Well, let's see. I am a voice actor, uh, occasionally on-camera actor. I I can't say the name, but there is going to be a movie in the next 12 months where I will be seen very briefly, but I'll be seen (laughs) alongside Robert De Niro, Pacino, Pesci, and uh, who's the fourth guy? Uh, Ray Romano. Oh, wow. But for like literally nine seconds, but it's cool. (laughs) It's a very nice thing uh, for the resume, but I can't name it yet. (laughs) That's awesome. So you were telling me an amazing story on Facebook when you messaged me about how you lied your way into an awesome experience. Can you just tell everyone more about that? Yeah, it's a little bit weird that much of my career sort of sprung from this lie, but luck is weird that way. It was, (laughs) I think, 91, might have been 92, but it was around the time that the Red Hot Chili Peppers were becoming huge successes with their album. Uh, not Blood Sugar Sex Magic, but uh, Mother's Milk, that's the one, when they were covering Higher Ground by Stevie Wonder. And my friends and I were really enjoying it. We were hanging out in my apartment on McDougal Street here in New York City and really bored. And it was about maybe two, three in the afternoon. And I was, th- uh, I started thumbing through the booklet, the CD booklet, and I saw that they named their manager. I said, you know, we are represented by Lindy Getz. And I knew that they were going on Letterman that night, and that Letterman was going to tape in about an hour, maybe an hour and a half. I said, you know what? Just one of my friends. I sent everyone else home. (laughs) I left one friend here with me and said, listen, you want to do something really stupid with me? Let's go up to 30 Rock. Tell the security guard that we work for, looked at the CD booklet again, make sure (laughs) I got the name right, Lindy Getz. And my friend was like, yeah, I mean, what's the worst that can happen? These days, if you were to try something like that at 30 Rock, the worst that could happen would be really awful. (laughs) But at this time, you know, this much more sort of innocent age where you couldn't Google somebody and you weren't presumed to just wildly dangerous threat just because you tell a little white lie. So we went up to the security guard in the lobby, fully expecting to be turned away, but we dropped Lindy Gets' name and were immediately escorted VIP style (laughs) to the dressing room of the Red Hot Chili Peppers where Lindy Gets was. And where I was introduced as an employee of his. And he sort of looked at me like, okay. (laughs) And I was amazed because I thought, all right, once we're here, it's going to get really bad. When the guy I claim to work for looks me in the eye in an enclosed space, that's when this whole charade's going to fall apart. And I don't know what I'm going to do. But he just acted like, oh, yeah, hey, how are you doing? Nice to see you. Gave my friend and I seats, sat in the front row. And then again, after the show. We were once again escorted back to the dressing room, which was really, I thought, all right, we've gotten away with it. Let's, let's not do this. But the guards carried us over, and I saw Lindy Getz again, <laughs> along with the Chili Peppers. And he said, listen, really quietly, he said, listen, that was a rather bold lie. And <laughs> if you actually want to work with me for free, uh, come up in the summer and intern for me in the band. And although I love New York very much, I'm not crazy about it in the summer. So I went, spent the summer interning for the Chili Peppers, 
It was a really interesting experience. By this time, I think Blood Sugar Sex Magic had come out. They'd been booked for Lollapalooza, and it was very, very huge. I remember that Under the Bridge was just the hottest thing in the world at that time. Yeah. And gosh, I mean, like the day after I landed, there was a massive earthquake. A few days later, it was the Rodney King riots. It was a very eventful (laughs) time in L.A., and for the band, of course. Really, the credit is to Lindy, who managed it with such grace and just sort of niceness and decency that you really don't see a lot. And as I would later learn, you really don't see it much in the entertainment field. Mm. But he, I don't know if he was charmed by the lie, was just in a good charitable mood, but uh, it worked out really well. Um, The band were really terrific. It was a really great learning experience, sort of my first in many ways, adult job, because the work was really, really intense and paid nothing. So I flew myself out, paid for lodging, but the opportunity was really, really incredible, and it sort of led to everything else from there. As I'd been there for like a month or so, I loved the people I worked with, and I loved the band, but I realized I was desperately homesick for New York City. I grew up here, and it is a very unique place. If you sort of have your formative years spent here, It's very hard to get comfortable anywhere else for more than like, you know, a weekend, maybe a week or something. The idea of spending too much time there, I I hadn't thought it through. I missed it desperately. And so I started making plans to come back. Um, And because I was homesick, one of the things I did was listen to Howard Stern, who had recently started being syndicated to L.A. And that got me thinking about maybe I can intern there. And and shortly after I returned home, I started working at K-Rock again as an intern. but it eventually led to me having a full-time on-air job, which was, honestly, I don't think anything surprised me more than that, because in the beginning, it was a classic rock station where really old, really well-respected and highly paid DJs work. And everyone from Stern to the jocks to management said, listen, we love having you, your spirit. I was a workaholic, to be honest with you. I worked. I, I didn't want to go home. I was in a bad relationship. My girlfriend and I were fighting. I really loved writing and producing comedy bits, so I would basically stay at the station day and night for free. And everyone said, just to be clear, don't expect a job here. This is where old folks go to make hundreds of thousands of dollars. You'll certainly never be on the air. And then something happened. It was a law, I think, that Bill Clinton pushed in around 96, saying that I think the basic effect was that you could suddenly own many more radio stations you know, that used to be very limited how much of the media any one party could control. So my boss overnight fired all the classic rock DJs and decided we were, I think it was called then alternative music. Anything short of like, you know, very, very white bread metal was alternative. And um, they needed jocks. And they asked me if I'd record a demo reel. I did and paid some money to SAG to join and Within a couple of days, I was a full-time on-air personality. It was a very whirlwind kind of experience, but again, very rewarding. So, yeah. <laughs> so, do you take credit for your whole experience with the Chili Peppers to get you there? Do I take credit? You mean for the lie? Do you, yeah, yeah. Well, I sort of think that the credit goes to Lindy, honestly, because mm. I've had lots of stupid ideas and acted on them, and. Very few of them have worked out that well. (laughs) And I think a lot, like nine out of 10 people would see me come. And so I think nine out of 10, certainly band managers who, among other things, are really protective of their clients. I think Lindy only managed the Chili Peppers. Yeah. And maybe, maybe like Flea had a side project band called Thelonious Monster. And I think technically Lindy managed them as well, but they did like two gigs a year. Yeah. So I think like, for instance trying to think of a major music manager anymore i don't know if like bob rock saw me coming to talk to metallica i think he'd have like thrown me to the floor cuffed me and turned me over <laughs> to the police so i i really owe a lot to lindy who yep. you know even between the time i met him and accepted his offer and the internship which was many many months away the band came back to play in new york this was really an amazing thing they played three nights at the roseland which is on like 54th and broadway i think and again, this was 91 or two. I think at this point it was 91. And they did three nights there uh, with opening act Smashing Pumpkins and a brand new band that no one had ever heard of. They were giving out free cassettes of their album, which was going to be released in a few weeks, Pearl Jam. Mm-hmm. So sitting in VIP, watching Soundcheck, it's just amazing. And um, 
again, I really think credit there goes to Lindy. Yeah. Whatever happened next, I take credit for. And, oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what do you think for someone to be able to do what you did? What kind of skills would someone need, you know, in terms of just trying to get your way into an amazing experience? Do you think confidence plays a big part in that? Confidence, uh, determination, a sort of, I don't want to say stupidity, but <laughs> like like a willingness to, just like in performing, a willingness to really step outside yourself and just like go forget the many odds against you, forget all the barriers in your way, yeah. just say, screw it. You know, this is, be ready to fail spectacularly and hope for the best. Yeah. So uh, I guess like if it doesn't work out at the end of the day, what's the worst thing that can happen? Yeah. So do you have any other examples of things? You said some of them hadn't paid off. Um, do you have any other stories that you could share? Sure. Um, specifically relating to lying on resumes or just about what my career yeah. turned out to be after that? Anything exciting that you want to share with us, that'd be awesome. Okay. Well, the chili peppers were really interesting to work with, really great to work with. It was, you know, for their first four albums, really, up until Mother's Milk broke and Higher Ground broke, they'd been a band for like 12 years and had been very, very unsuccessful in many ways. They sold very little. People didn't have any knowledge of them. Uh, their producers and record labels, for the most part, hated them. They were a little bit wild and had been on lots and lots of drugs. And they were in, for the most part, really, really backing away from that. Mm -hmm. Even as they were suddenly going, oh, you know, we're not just playing little clubs anymore. We're rock stars. And sort of watching that experience was really very interesting. Mm -hmm. Helped inform a lot of stuff for me as I, you know, never reached that sort of success, not being a musician either. But it really informed a lot of how I handled my career as it progressed and, and still do. And it was really cool driving around with Flea, who was the nicest guy on the planet, who had a Mercedes Benz with a, I don't know if you're familiar with his first band, Fear. No, I'm not. Some it was, <laughs> I think they're mostly known, they're mostly known because John Belushi on Saturday Night Live was a huge fan. And they actually did an episode of SNL in like 79. And it was, it was pretty intense. I believe they were banned for life, and I think they cut to a commercial midway through the show. It was a really hardcore band, and their big song. Is it okay to swear? Yeah, yeah, go for it. The song for which they were known, and the, I think the song they tried to play on SNL before they cut the commercial, was called I Don't Care About You, Fuck You. <laughs> and so Flea had this Benz with a huge I Don't Care About You, Fuck You bumper sticker on it. And it was really, really... I just thought, wow, you know, you can just be like a goofy guy. And as long as you develop a skill, you don't have to conform, which was good because I was never good at that. I was m much better at, for instance, just bold-faced lying to a guard at Rockefeller Center <laughs> than I was at really paying attention, for instance, to my college. Yep. And actually, you know, my internship at K-Rock lasted years and years and years. And eventually I, dr I did drop out of college. Um, because as much as I loved earning credit for my work, I was really addicted to the work, and I just stayed there day and night. Mm -hmm. And that, too, um, if you really love it once you're there, never underestimate what could come of it. Because, you know, every person there, every person who cared about me, you know, it was all with the best of intentions to protect me. But, you know, listen, Matt, this will never, ever happen for you. And I acknowledged it. I said, I understand. I get it. And then one day it did happen. Mm. And I don't know. From there, I just thought, all right, trust your instincts. Try to not overmanage and over panic about stuff. Because, you know, if I'd stopped for even a second on the way to Rockefeller Center and thought it through, I'd have turned around and gone home. Yeah. So it's sort of just like embracing, not, you know, health wise, but in general, if you've got a crazy idea, Dangerous, not in the sense of causing yourself physical or emotional harm, but dangerous like you could really do a face plant. Mm -hmm. But you really want to do it? Why not do it? Yeah, that's right. You only learn from your failures anyway. Yeah, it's like, oh, I face planted. All right, I won't do that again. I'll do this instead. Yeah. No, that's definitely a great look way of looking at it. And, like, 
I think if you look at the Red Hot Chili Peppers, like he said, they were a band for so long before they became successful. And I was talking to someone else last night about how, um, you know, we think, well, people from my generation uh, want a quick fix and, you know, want to be an overnight success. And I think one of the key things that we all need to remember is things don't necessarily happen overnight. And same with you, the radio station, like, doesn't always happen straight away. But if you're determined enough, you should really work hard for it. Oh, yeah. Anytime you're failing and you're trying to break into a field and you're frustrated and feel like giving up, what Google has, you know, what we have now that we didn't have then, the internet and Google, there are entire websites just dedicated to, like, every rejection letter that Stephen King ever got from a publisher. Oh, wow. And there's stuff like, this idea of a woman who causes fire is ridiculous. You're the worst writer ever. And then really old stuff that was kept by writers like Poe and... Oh, gosh. I don't know. Just about every modern-day fiction teller, mm. there's an archive of publishers not just rejecting them, but saying stuff like, you're illiterate, you're the worst writer ever, wow. you know, women in horror will never be okay, you're crazy. Similarly, you know, the, the Beatles got shut down by several managers, yeah. as did the Stones, and of course the Chili Peppers. They used to be, up until uh, Blood Sugar Sex Magic, they were on EMI. And EMI really actively suppressed them. They really hated them. They wanted them gone. And I don't exactly understand why they didn't just break their contract and turn them loose. But, I mean, it was like 12 years of their career just being sort of kept really out of the spotlight. Yeah. I think what had happened was, this is what Fleet told me, and it does sort of sound like them, that there was a shareholder meeting shortly after they'd signed with their, for their like first album. And they didn't know that there was anything going on in the boardroom, or maybe they did and were on drugs and didn't care. But there was some big sort of important meeting of the minds and the shareholders and all the money people. And the Chili Peppers ran in naked and jumped up on the table and made a big noise and said, hey, we're the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and uh, much, much like my decision, which did not work out, uh, or rather that did, um, for them, they tried something bold and stupid and crazy, and it really hurt them for like a long time. It's amazing to think that now they're in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and like the biggest yep. band on the planet, because um, EMI hated them, and they could have made millions with them. Wow, that's interesting. So, yeah. um, do you have any? I have a quote that I live by all the time, but do you have a quote or something that you love live by that you could share with everyone? Not a quote, uh, a sort of ethos. Well, all right. If you want to hear another crazy story that doesn't involve lying, but does involve the weirdness of my career. Sure. I had a conversation that I still sort of live by to this day. Um, so after I got on the air at K-Rock, I was there for like a, I, I'd been there for a couple of years. And my birthday is New Year's Eve. And a friend of mine from the station who really was deep in, embedded with, like, Sean Lennon, the Beastie Boys. He really was friends with everybody. Uh, Sean Lennon and the Beasties and, oh, gosh, well, the Jim Rose Circus, if you're familiar with them from the early days of Lollapalooza, they were this traveling sideshow pretty much all through the 90s that um, there was a guy who could, like, squeeze himself through a tennis racket. There was a guy who hung, like, anvils from his chest. It was really like a grotesque sideshow mm -hmm. theater that instead of being part of a circus, tended to open for rock bands. So he was there, and uh, it was my birthday present. We went, hung out backstage, watched the show, and I met Jim Rose, the, the headmaster of this crazy carnival act. Mm -hmm. And he said, hey, listen, come up on stage with me. We'll do a trick where I put an apple in your mouth and carve your name into it with a chainsaw. Yeah. I, I said, yeah, that's not going to happen. <laughs> I'm not okay with that, and I'm not proud of this fact, but it is. It, it was an educational thing. He looked at me in the eyes, began speaking very softly and slowly, and literally the next thing I knew, I was on stage. There was a chainsaw inches away from my nose, and he was almost done. He hypnotized me. Wow. And afterwards, he was like, hey, come on, hang out. You're a good guy. Thanks for not being a jerk about it. I was like, well, I... I was really just sort of stunned from it all. And I think I might have said something like, oh, hey, I'm thinking about getting a tattoo because I had been at the time. And he said, no, listen, you don't need a tattoo. You don't need to be at the show. You are the show. 
you give tattoos. It was a little bit sort of uh, a little pretentious in yeah. hindsight and a little bit, um, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, a little bit self-important for both me and him. But I did sort of get it that like you're not exactly the audience and you're not exactly the performer. But you're sort of a bridge, which is certainly what he'd been able to do, carve out a niche for himself where he ran a freak show that didn't have to go to the circus, that could instead go on tour with Nine Inch Nails. Yeah. And um, I, what I really got from it was, A, to continue embracing my sort of more absurd side, you know, mm -hmm. more risky and crazy, and uh, to not get locked into patterns and to not, to, to feel as though the world really is open. Yeah. And and that you can sort of control your own destiny. Yeah. Oh, that's an awesome story. Um, yeah. Do you have any other final thoughts or comments that you want to share? Well, I've lied on my resume many times since. <laughs> a couple times it's worked. A couple times it hasn't. I mean, it's been really small stuff. Yeah. Um. Eventually, it got to a point where just the legitimate work I'd done was so extensive that now when I send out resumes, I have to sort of customize them because my actual work experience is like nine pages long, double-sided. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And so it was definitely worth it for that. And I don't know that lying is necessarily like a blanket thing I want to endorse. Yeah. In fact, I'm going to go on the record as saying I don't endorse blanket lying. Mm -hmm. Please, you know, try not to lie to like your family and friends unless of course. there's just something awful that they can go without knowing, yeah. I guess. Yeah, no. But, yeah. But ultimately, even with Lindy Getz, it turned out that honesty was the best policy when, like, he turned on me and said, listen, I know you're full of shit, but if you want to actually do it, come do it. And yeah. I think if I hadn't done that, I would have never ended up in the entertainment industry. I mean, it's conceivable. Yeah. I don't really have any other skills to speak of. Like, I could have been a writer, I guess, but I, I, I think from, like, the very first, like, one of my very first memories, I basically just learned to read. And I saw a Bugs Bunny cartoon end and saw the credit voiced by Mel Blanc. And a seed was planted really early on. It's like, oh, my God, I'm learning math and stuff in school and, you know, whatever else. And you can do cartoon voices for a living. This, <laughs> this opens things up for me. There may be hope for me yet. <laughs> and, you know, if you want something like that, be it in the entertainment industry, fashion, I don't know, anything that's not middle of the road, anything that doesn't have a clear career path, like yeah. being a lawyer or a doctor, try. You know, I, I think if you get to your mid to late 20s and you're not succeeding, you know, maybe get another job and continue to try. But really, there are opportunities everywhere. Mm. You've just got to really, really dig. And in the age of Google, I do think, again, it is easier to get caught lying, mm. but it's also easier to discover cool new tactics like all right i'm not succeeding but let me get a list of every agent if for instance you want to be a voice actor and don't hound them but be persistent yeah yeah no that's that's it's it, i think it's just one of those things if you're passionate enough and you're determined you just really got to work hard for it and i think you've yeah. with many people past and present yeah yeah and like walk that fine line between determination and not quite desperation, but like, you know, understanding that this is your life's path and you've got to see it through. Mm. But don't get, because this has happened to me a couple of times, don't make something such a sort of monolithic achievement in your mind before you get there that once you land there, you're freaked out and sort of feel like, oh God, I don't belong here. It, people in the entertainment industry, I, I think in particular, are very prone to imposter syndrome, which is ironic because. I didn't have imposter syndrome when I was an actual imposter starting out for the Red Hot Chili Peppers. <laughs> I was very comfortable there. But, like, I've landed at, for instance, some jobs in TV or various voice gigs I've been offered, which I've taken, where you've been building it up as this mountainous, just huge achievement that's, like, forever out of reach, that you can sort of make it bigger than it is and come off all awkward and weird. Mm-hmm. And, and just be yourself and believe in yourself and see it through. And yeah, determination is just about everything. Second to determination, I would say research, because there are so many avenues 
you know, it seems like no one is hiring in this field or that field or this or the other. But think about back doors. Think about ways you can get in touch with, like, I don't know, if you're trying to break into writing. See if you can find the guy who works for the agency, the, the talent agency, who does all the reading for the actual agents. And maybe you can get your transcript to him or her. You know, there are many, many paths to just about any goal you can perceive. Yeah. I guess it's like thinking outside the box a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and embracing your own nuttiness if, <laughs> if you really think you got a shot. Yeah. Because generally speaking, the worst that'll happen is nothing. Yeah. That's so true. And you won't know unless you try, so. Yeah. Might as well give it a go. All right. Well, we might leave it there, but can you just tell us where we can find you, promote your podcast and any socials that you have? Oh, gosh. I don't know. I'm pretty shy. I would never. I mean, okay. Yeah, <laughs> uh, of course. Uh, my podcast is the Matt Sager podcast, and you can always find both the most recent episode and I think the entire archive at mattsagerpodcast.com. That's uh, Matt with two T's. My last name is S-A-G-E-R. And uh, my voiceover reels, uh, various blog posts, uh, more episodes of the podcast, and a ton of my social profiles are on my page, mattsagervoiceover.com. And uh, gosh, if you want, you can find me on Twitter, at Matt Sager. Uh, Instagram, I'm Real Matt Sager. And on Facebook, hope I'm not overindulging here. Nah, go for it. <laughs> okay. My personal page is The Matt Sager. Uh, my voiceover page is Matt Sager VO, and my podcast page is Matt Sager Podcast. Great, thanks. Got a lot going on. <laughs> yes, and anyone who's interested, my reels and contact info, such as my phone number and stuff, email address, are both at uh, mattsagervoiceover.com. Perfect. Well, thanks so much for joining. Thank I you really very much. It. This was really fun. Okay, thanks. That was insane. I'm sure Matt has lived a very, very exciting life. Um, Red Hot Chili Peppers, what an amazing story. But I think what we can take away from that is not lying as such, as I've said in the past, but if you if you know you have the ability to achieve things that might not be in your reach in terms of qualification or who you are or who you know, just give it a go anyway. You never know what's going to happen and you might land yourself in an amazing opportunity. Now that leaves me with the quote for this episode and I got it um, from doing a strategy presentation at work and it's about change because I know change can be really hard sometimes but we need to really embrace change because eventually we probably won't even know the difference and change is always around us. It's never not going to happen. So you're best off just to embrace it rather than fight it. For this quote is from Socrates and it's, the secret of change is to focus all your energy, not on fighting the old, but on building the new. And as I said, change is all around us. So if we focus on the change and how we can benefit and improve from it, then it's not going to be so scary in the end. And you waste a lot of energy fighting on the old and that's all from me for this episode just remember always love yourself because you're your biggest advocate all right thanks guys i hope you got something out of today's episode and if you like my podcast don't forget to tell all your amazing friends also subscribe rate and review on itunes it'll only take you a few minutes but it really goes a long way in helping me out so i'd be super grateful if you could do that you can find more information on this show and the show notes by clicking on the link in the description. You can also add me on Instagram, on my personal account at underscore Mariah McInnes underscore, or my travel page at A Traveller's Antics. If you have any questions, please message me on any of those, or you can email me at Mariah underscore McInnes 22 at Outlook.com. Also, you can read more from me on my blog at travelersantics.blog. And what should you read for this fortnight? Well, I have some really good content on things that I've learned from traveling, but also from being on my own. I think we can all learn a lot from being on our own or from traveling or putting ourselves in a different situation. So I just go through some of the ones, the key ones that I've learned over my time of being on my own and also traveling. 
And also, I've got another vlog on the amazing food of Vietnam. So if you're looking to go to Vietnam soon, or you're not sure if it's a place to go and you're a huge foodie, check out the vlog. You'll be amazed at the beautiful food they have on offer. All right, have a great fortnight. So I headed to Vietnam late 2018. And the one thing that you don't even think about is if you'll need a visa or not. I was just imagining the amazing food and the beautiful Ha Long Bay, but luckily for Vietnam visas. They make the whole visa process so, so easy. So to book your visas, please go to the link in the show notes, which I'll add, or in the description. You'll find all the information that you need to know, and they will help you make sure your trip to Vietnam is super amazing. 